what we do look at is rarities. We believe, like the modern portfolio theorists believe, that on a daily basis, the stock market move, movement is random. Random. I don't know what's going to happen to do tomorrow. I don't know what the market's going to do a week from now. I can't predict it. On a general basis, market movements are random. However, however, at turning points, the action of the market is not random. Now, when I say the action of the market is not random, I don't mean the, the daily movement of the stock prices. I mean the underlying indicators that occur at market turning points are not random. They're very rare. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko, and on today's episode, I'm joined by Milton Berg. Welcome to the show. Hello, Rebecca. Nice meeting you. Thank you so much for coming on today. I've been really looking forward to this discussion, and I wanted to begin by talking about your background as an investor, because as I understand it, you initially focused on fundamental analysis inspired by the teachings of Graham and Dodd, but then you later shifted to technical analysis and worked with some legendary investors in the hedge fund world before starting your own research and advisory firm. So I was hoping you could share with us what motivated your transition to become a technical analyst. Just what drew you to this strategy? Great. Well, there's some misconceptions about Graham and Dodd. Maybe I can sort of discuss a little bit about uh, Benjamin Graham's investment philosophy, how it worked and whether it worked or not. Um, I originally got into this business. You know, technical analysis looked to me like, you know, voodoo. People looking at charts and lines and crossings and things, all these kind of crazy stuff which made no sense. You're buying a company, you're buying a stock. Of course, value is important. I really spent my uh, college days and days in the early in the, in the field becoming a professional Benjamin Graham type analyst, doing rigorous security analysis, analyzing balance sheets, finding good companies. I went to a uh, meeting of the New York Society of Security Analysts, goes back to 1979, and a fellow named Ned Davis, who at that time was the chief market strategist at J.C. Bradford, he made his presentation. He basically made a simple presentation about how some sentiment indicators work far better in, in calling market turns than um, fundamental valuation uh, analysts. Um, and uh, that sort of struck me. I mean, how can, how can this market, uh, um, how can data, there's nothing to do with a particular company, how could that have some sort of predictive ability in what the market's going to do? And that really was, uh, was my first uh, initiation to technical analysis. But then I started realizing and reading Graham and Dodd's book, he himself said that, that his rigorous valuation analysis does not really work. For example, as you know, Benjamin Graham, during the Great Depression, his value analysis did not help him. His, his uh, portfolio, his, he had a... a um, partnership, his partnership lost 80 to 85 percent during the Great Depression. So what he did didn't protect him from that great uh, market decline. And then I realized that not only did his approach not help him during the Great Depression, but the Great Depression got him very scared. And he spent the rest of his career worrying about the next Great Depression. And that's why he came up with this, this uh, valuation analysis. He talked about buying stocks below the net net asset value. I mean, he looked at fine stocks that are so, so cheap that even if you're in the Great Depression, there's a good chance to be able to get out of it somehow in the future at, a, at, a, at the price you paid for it. His system really was a system of protecting us from the kind of a depression, the kind of market crash that he never expected, he never anticipated, he couldn't protect himself from. Now, however, the, the last Great Depression was in the 1920, late 1920s, early 1930s, and Graham was in the business from in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And his valuations didn't work because the market kept going up. Even the, the market kept going above his, uh, his valuation pa parameters. So Benjamin Graham himself had to revise his valuation formulas multiple times. He revised it in the 40s, he revised it in the, in the, in the 60s. And finally in 1970, uh, Benjamin Graham publicly said, rigorous security analysis no longer works, is no longer necessary. And he advised other formulas for buying stocks based on P ratios, historical price action, and so on. So although Graham, Benjamin Graham's idea of buying value was an idea that uh, makes sense and maybe, maybe works somewhat, he himself was very confused by, by market action. And he, I can't say he himself proved that value investing is the greatest thing to be involved in. And he himself, again, in his career, changed his mind. Now, why was value investing work? What logic is there for value, value investing? Because, for example, if a stock is cheap today, so obviously 
obviously, a stock could be cheap. So why must we assume that sometime in the future, the stock will get back to fair value? Is this a magic formula? Why is it? So this is really a question that was asked to Benjamin Graham in front of Congress in 1954. And this is very important to understand how value investing works. Uh, there's a Senator Fulbright. In 1954, the stock market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, got back to where it was in 1929. 25 years later, the market is back at its peak. So people are wondering, or Congress is wondering, hey, the market is back to its price in 29. Maybe there'll be another market crash. You know, Congress always worries about the wrong things. So they're worried there'll be another market crash 25 years later because the market reached the same level. And they brought Benjamin Graham, who was considered the expert of market valuation, he, a professor in Columbia Business School. He's running a very large uh, investment partnership. They called him into Congress. The date was March 11th, 1955, roughly 68 years ago. And the following question was asked by Senator Fulbright to Benjamin Graham. And this, I'm, I'm quoting, I'll read it in quotes. When you find a special situation and you decide, just for illustration, that you can buy it for $10 and it's actually worth $30 and you take a position, but you cannot realize a gain until other people decide it's worth $30. How is that process brought about? Is it by advertising? What happens? So basically, Graham was asked the question, why does value investing work? If a stock can be cheap today, why can't it be cheap forever? If a stock can be overpriced today, why can't it be overpriced forever? Now, Benjamin Graham's answer was following, I'm going to quote, and he says to this question, that is one of the mysteries of our business, and it's a mystery to me as well as to everybody else. But we know from history and experience that eventually the market catches up with value. There was no great fundamental understanding and value investing, he looked at history. He said, well, if you buy a stock that's cheap, eventually you'll be able to get out of it. He really was looking at value investing as a form of technical analysis. And since he called it a mystery, I said to myself, well, wh why should I get involved in the mystery of value analysis? Let me be involved in other mysteries of technical analysis. Let, let me broaden the, the mystery and history of the stock market. And try to find other methods of picking stocks and other methods of trying to understand uh, whether to be in a market or not to be in a market, and so on and so forth. Now, I, I, again, I must stress that Benjamin Graham, uh, the, uh, these works are published, really, 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 really never got it right. He was always behind the curve. He's always suggesting the market is overvalued, the market can go up, and then he'd raise his parameters, but he never raised his parameters where the market actually was. So, that's basically what got me to look at the technical analysis. Now, technical analysis, the approach that I use is sort of a unique type of approach. I don't really look at squiggly lines. I don't really look at, uh, at breakouts and breakdowns and moving averages. We have our own uh, type of indicators that we use. Um, but the background basically is I began as a real fundamentalist. I believe in fundamental analysis. Fundamentalism makes a lot of sense. You want to buy a bond, you know, you wonder whether the company's going to be bank go bankrupt or pay off their interest and so on. But when it comes to the stock market, there's so many more factors other than valuation. That's what we got involved in, in, using, um, in using what we call market analysis and, and the indicators we've corrected. We've um, in the case we've um, discovered and so on. Yeah, that was such a great backstory. Thanks for sharing that. I want to dive into your strategy a little bit later in the discussion. I'm super curious to dig into your perspective on markets a bit because you just outlined the perspective of markets from a traditional value investor such as Benjamin Graham. But how do you view markets and particularly the randomness in markets or if they're not random at all? Yeah, well, let's let's look at that. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know about Rex Sinquefield and Roger Roger Ibbotson. They put out a book, um, basically called "Stock Bonds, Bills, and Inflation," and looked at history of the stock market, history of the bond market, going back to the early 1900s, and they actually made predictions based on it. They looked at the stock market as some sort of a physical system, and they said, "Well, look at the look at the volatility of the market over the last." They published this, in, I think, in the 1980s. So, look at the volatility of the market over the last 80 years. Look at the rates of change in the market in the last 80 years. Look at the standard deviation of returns over the last 80 years. And what we saw in the last 80 years is what you could expect over the, over the future now. That would only make sense. It doesn't really make sense because the stock market is a dynamic force. Why must we assume that the rates of, of return that we had over the last 80 years will continue in the future? Many things can change. A country could change from capitalist to communist. You know, you could have, um, you could have uh, a, a run on banks. You could have... Uh, uh, the currency um, devalued through inflation. Many things can happen in the future that did not happen in the past. So one of the mistakes many analysts make, I look, look at the stock market of the past, 
analyze here and say this is what happened in the future. Now, what exactly what happened in 1987, the great crash, the SP 500 declined over 20% in one day. And somebody asked Roger Ibbotson the following question. I read your book about statistical analysis of the stock market. Based on your book, the, never in the history of the stock market should have declined 20% in one day because it never did decline 20% in one day in the past, in the past 80 years. And he actually puts this question in his book. And he says, well, let's look at the monthly returns. We didn't create an outlier in the monthly returns. Basically, he was basically fudging. The stock market is not a physical system. By virtue of the fact that in order to understand stock price movements, you have to look at the history, that suggests that is not something that can be analyzed because you take a pair of dice and you want to analyze statistically what are the chances of getting the um, 12, what are the chances of getting uh, the um, uh, snake eyes and so on. You don't have to look at the history of the, of the, of the dice. You have to look at the numbers and use statistical analysis. By virtue of the fact that you have to look at the history of the stock market in order to understand how it will perform in the future, that itself tells you that the stock market is really not analyzable it's really random, basically, because uh, who says what happened in the past will happen in the future? There's nothing inherent in the system of stocks to tell you that the future will be like the past. So right away, I, I look at the stock market a little differently than the statisticians do, and I say, really, you can't use rigorous statistical analysis on the stock market. Once you have to look at history and experience, it's no longer a, a system because the system is now dynamic. However, what do we look at? Well, what we do look at is rarities. We believe, like the modern portfolio theorists believe, that on a daily basis, the stock market move, movement is random. Random. I don't know what's going to happen to do tomorrow. I don't know the market going to do a week from now. I can't predict it. On a general basis, market movements are random. However, however, at turning points, the action of the market is not random. Now, when I say the action of the market is not random, I don't mean the, the daily movement of the stock prices. I mean the underlying indicators that occur at market turning points are not random. They're very rare, and they occur at turning points. At great pro they, they give you great probability where the market's going to rally or the market's going to decline. And it's these kind of, it's these kind of, uh, of, of um, this kind of information that we look at, always realizing, always recognizing that the stock market is not some sort of machine, and that we're only working on probabilities, and some things that happened in the past won't happen in the future. But, um, but we do believe that uh, although the stock market on a general basis is random, at major turning points, sometimes at minor turning points, the, the market gives you information that allows you to make a high probability call prediction or call projection or call to trade based on the information that the market is generating. So I just want to tie this together because we have a, quite a big community of value investors who follow um, strategies well, taught by a Value war. investing is terrible. Idle value investing. I mean, unfortunately, as you know, I don't want to mention any names, but there was one of great world famous value investors. He managed over $22 billion of, of, of mutual funds because uh, you know, he, he was a value guy. When the markets weren't cheap, he wouldn't buy stocks. And he only bought them were cheap. He did very well for a number of years. And unfortunately, he did because the market was overvalued from basically uh, late 1990s until, you know, uh, until now it's basically an overvalued. And he wasn't invested and people were pulling money out of his funds. And he went down from $22 billion to less than $2 billion, and he decided to take his life, which is very, very sad. Mm -hmm. But the point is you can't invest in the market being only a value investor. You never own an Apple. You'll never own a Microsoft. You'll never own many of these great growth stocks that were never really fit, fitting with uh, Benjamin Graham's value mm -hmm. investing. Now, I, I swear, so I, I say value, I call it suicidal because I've seen uh, people lose their careers because it stuck to value. And I started in the business. We talked about how I my transition I wrote an article about Barron's, this is in 1980. I tried to write a article about Barron's. I basically was pointing out, using Graham and Dodd's security analysis book, you know, the, the, the book for, uh, for market analysts. And I proved that the stock market is way, way overvalued and we should not have any bull markets ahead. The market must decline. And I basically did what Benjamin Graham was doing. Because Benjamin Graham always found the market overvalued. But I realized, fortunately, early in my career, that value, if you rise strictly on value, you will not be successful. I really, I really challenge, find me someone who rise strictly on value has been successful. And don't mention Warren Buffett, because read Warren Buffett's biography. He switched sometime in the, uh, in the early 80s from following rigorous statistical analysis, buying stocks that were very, 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 very cheap based on value analysis. And he decided through the, through the advice of Charlie Munger 
to buy stocks that are not necessarily very, very cheap, but they're good companies that are growing. And that's how uh, Benjamin, Benjamin, uh, Warren Buffett became the great investor that he did. He started to buy, look at, buy companies and buy stocks and not necessarily look for those cheap shit. I remember when I got into the business, he, he owned things like Handy and Harmon, VF Corp. He owned a number of companies that really weren't great. And even Berkshire Hathaway, he ultimately went under. He bought Berkshire Hathaway. It didn't turn out to be a good investment at all. He bought that. There was a great transition from textile industry in the United States. Textile industry moved to Asia. And great companies like Berkshire Hathaway is one of the great largest companies in America. I remember back in the 1980s, uh, Warren Buffett was invested in stocks like VF Corp and uh, Handy and Harmon because they were deep, deep over, uh, undervalued stocks. But subsequent to that, he started investing in companies. So he invested in Coca-Cola, one of his famous investments. Coca-Cola wasn't a, a deep value stock. It was basically a growth stock that was trading at the fair value. So even uh, uh, the, the idea that Benjamin Graham puts forth in his books are no longer followed by successful value investors. Successful value investors themselves have um, graduated from Benjamin Graham's type of investment analysis. And those who stick to Benjamin Graham's type of investment of, of, of value analysis really have not done well in the business. I can't find any that have. And that's Sequoia Funds, which was once a great uh, follower of, of Benjamin Graham. So you really don't see it. Um, there, there's a great uh, market analyst who's been out of the market for about 12 years now. He, he, has a, he you know, He's on Twitter and he, uh, he has some mutual funds and they haven't done anything because he's suggesting based on Benjamin Graham's analysis of markets, we got to go down another 60%. That might happen. It may go down 60%, but if you're going to sit waiting 12 years for that to happen, there's no way you're going to maintain a business and get a, get a good return. So that's why I say that uh, the value analysis really doesn't work. It's never been proven to work. Pure value analysis. And... Um, Everybody uses something more than just value analysis to, to do their uh, to do their market uh, market uh, uh, investment. Even though uh, the fellow uh, John Templeton, when he was interviewed by Forbes twenty years ago, thirty years ago, he said, "If I two, buy two stocks that are equally undervalued, I'll buy the one that is starting to move." Now, what does that mean? That's technical analysis. Yeah, two stocks are equally undervalued. I'll buy the one that is starting to move. If you're a real value right. investor, you'll buy the one that hasn't started to move because it's a little bit cheaper. So people realize it's far more to the market than value analysis. And to be honest, Benjamin Graham, people don't realize this, but Benjamin Graham himself was under the impression that it's far more to the market than value analysis. And I'll just quote from his book again, if that's okay. Um, he says, the influence, of, the influence of what we call Value factors over the market price is partial and indirect. Partial because it frequently competes with purely speculative factors, which influence the price in the opposite direction, and indirect because it acts through the intermediary of people's sentiments and decisions. He says basically that you can't, the market doesn't move strictly on value. The market moves on many other factors, including sentiment, psychology, technical factors, and speculative factors. And what we try to do is not focus on value, but focus on these other factors that move stocks and see what we can do to get sort of an edge in investing in the stock market. I want to dive into one more Benjamin Graham quote that is often quoted. I think Buffett said it in, he was paraphrasing Benjamin Graham in 1987. In the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. I wanted to get your interpretation of this and your perspective on what this means for market performance in the short run versus long run. Is it more based on psychology or is it fundamentals? I am so glad you asked me this question because Buffett got it wrong. His great teacher, Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett never said what Warren Buffett said he said. Never said it. I'll read the words of Warren Buffett, of, of Benjamin Graham. I have it in front of me as well. And this is a quote from Screen House, page 42, and page 43. The original published in the 1920s, 1930s. He says the following, in other words, the market is not a weighing machine. In other words, he doesn't say it is, not, it is not a weighing machine over the short term. He says the market is not a weighing, weighing machine on which the value of each issue is recorded by an exact and impersonal mechanism in accordance with specific qualities. Rather, we say, says Benjamin Graham, the market is a voting machine where on countless individuals register choices which are the product partly of reason, partly of emotion. What Benjamin Graham was saying is the market is always and ever a voting machine. In order for the price of the stock to change, someone has to decide to buy and someone has to decide to sell. 
So in any given transaction, it's a voting machine. Now, if it's true that over the long term, a, a, a stock is a what is a, is a weighing machine, well, look, let's look at Warren Buffett's own stock. His stock is around what for fifty years already, and his latest uh, latest annual report, he discussed how his stock has fluctuated up twenty percent, down twenty percent, up twenty percent, down twenty percent in the last year. Although the value hasn't changed, isn't Warren Buffett's stock a long term stock? If it's true that over the long term the market is a weighing machine. About now, in the year 2022, shouldn't Warren Buffett stock be valued as a weigh, as a weighing machine? Shouldn't it not fluctuate? Of course not. The market is always and ever a voting machine. The market is never, ever a weighing machine. Occasionally, the weight of the, the, the weighing machine and the voting machine coincide. For Benjamin Green said, if you buy a stock that's cheap, eventually the stock will get back to its value. But that's not because the market becomes a, a weighing machine. That's because the typical fluctuation of a stock takes it back to true value. We don't know why that happens. But it happens through voting. It doesn't happen through weighing. So Benjamin Graham, uh, Warren Buffett's quote is incorrect. People, people, I've heard this quote uh, was, uh, repeated many, many times. And it's not the way markets work. Markets are totally, always and ever voting machines based on psychology, based on sentiment based on speculation, never ever based on the true fundamental of a company. There's no mechanism that allows the true fundamentals of a company to show up in a stock price. The only mechanism is through the voting of buying and selling. Glad you asked that question. Hope I'm, I didn't get too passionate about this. I'm glad to hear your answer on that. I have never heard that corrected before. So I'm glad that you were here today on the this show to give us the meaning behind that quote, because I have heard that so often. And so in a sense, then, if someone is trying to, if someone's, I guess, philosophy as an investor is that they pick stocks because they believe they are undervalued, I'm getting, I just want to clear this up for listeners. You're saying with your views of the market that it, the only way that it reaches its intrinsic value is because of randomness, this voting in the market. It's not because some catalyst will make it go to its intrinsic value? Well, there is a catalyst if there's a, let's say it'll be a takeover. But even the takeover, how many takeovers have you had above mm -hmm. intrinsic value? How many companies did takeovers and they, they pay too much for a stock, right? So even a, fa even a takeover has nothing to do with value. It's a sentiment of the company that's buying the stock. The market, there's no methodology at all for a market, a stock, a stock that trades in a market to trade at value. The only mechanism is people buying and people selling, which, is, which in effect is only voting. So yes, I disagree. I don't want to say it's random, but when Benjamin Graham says historically it's found, he said it's a mystery. But historically, if you buy cheap stock, it's going to go be, get back to value. Well, historically, you buy a stock because the five-day volume is the greatest in 14 years, and the stock's down 60% off its high. Uh, historically, most of those stocks also go back and gain 20, 30, 40%. So you're going to say that the, now the market is a technical machine? No, there are many factors going to the market, but ultimately, locally, it has to. It all has to do with voting and voting is psychology, voting is sentiment. Of course, people vote because of fundamentals. If if people if there's an economic crash or a recession, and people have to, they need money to, to pay for their mortgage, they need money to to get for food on the table. They'll sell their stocks to get the money, but that is also a voting decision. It might be based on some fundamental. But why sell the stock? Maybe they should sell the gold they have in the safe, or maybe they should should sell the house if they have a, if they're paying a mortgage on it. It's all a decision based on personal factors, nothing to do with the intrinsic value of a company. I'm adamant about this, and that people who say, and I say, people who follow true value of investment have never been very successful. Never been very successful. Benjamin Green does not follow true value investing. I mean, the kind that Benjamin Green spoke about, of course. He's very good. He's a very good market timer. Uh, uh, excuse me, Warren Buffett, excellent market timer. When stocks are expensive, he builds up his cash and he buys when stocks are, when, when the market comes down. He claims he's buying because stocks are cheap. That could be true, but there are many other factors that take place at a market low other than stocks being cheap. So it, it might be a coincidence that when he buys his stocks are cheap, but that is not necessarily the factor that gets the stocks to move up. As you know, it's very often stock can be cheap and, and get cheaper. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway is a great example. Not for the fact that Warren Buffett used Berkshire Hathaway as a means of buying other stocks, that company went totally bankrupt. Even his, his interview, you read about his, 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 uh, 
his uh, position in the Washington Post or one of the other, uh, I'm not sure exactly which newspaper he bought, he said it's only by chance, by the, by the luck of God, that he was able to come out of it. To, oh, okay, one of his competitors went bankrupt. He didn't know when he bought that cheap stock that a competitor would go bankrupt. This is far more involved than strictly value. And again, there's no mechanism. There's no mechanism for value to be reflected in the stock. There is a mechanism for sentiment to be reflected in the stock. I see, even if you're going to say a stock is cheap based on dividends, the only mechanism for the stock to uh, remain at this level is because people want those dividends. Now, that could change. They, 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 they may decide they don't need the, the high income, they need a lower income. It, every, everything, everything is in flux. Everything is based on psychology. Everything is based on decision. Everything is based on buying and selling, which is all a voting machine and is never, never, ever a voting machine. I want to dive into your investment strategy, though, now, because you've been your strategy is centered around identifying market tops and bottoms, a skill that you've honed over the three decades of market analysis. So could you talk a little bit about your framework, including how you developed it and the methods you use to identify significant turning points in the market? Okay. Well, first, I have to point out that what I do, we never deal in, 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 in um, certainties. Everybody, we, we admit we're only dealing in probabilities. Maybe some people out there think they're dealing in certainty. But we, we, we tell our clients that we understand that whatever we do, you're dealing in probabilities. I mean, uh, the market today, will there be a recession? Let's assume you... you the people pound the table that there'll be a recession. Are they willing to bet their life on it? Do they have 100% certainty? Of course not. Every decision that people make in the stock market is, 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 a, prop, is a decision based on probabilities. So first thing we recognize is, is that many of the indicators that we use do not have a 100% track record. They may only have a 70% track record or 80% track record. But you can't really, really can't expect more than that because even if they had a 100% track record. For example, I, buy, I, buy, I have a buy indicator that signals 14 times in the last 100 years, and each time the market held its low by never never declined more than 2% and had a bull market follow, right? It happened 14 times in a row. That doesn't tell me it's going to happen next time because, as I say, in theory, there's an infinite number of days for the stock market. The stock market will continue forever, and we only have a short period of 100 years of history. Maybe those 14 years were the outlier, 14 signals were an outlier and everything else will be the proper signal. What I'm trying to point out is very important for people who are watching the show to know that we only deal in probabilities. There's no such thing. We feel there's no such thing as dealing in certainties. And maybe great investors made many mistakes. He didn't really make a mistake. He made the right decision. It's just that his decision was based on a probability. And the probabilities don't always go in his favor. There are mistakes people make where they don't follow the proper judgment and uh, or don't follow the proper discipline. That's a mistake. But if the stock goes against you or your market projection goes against you, that doesn't mean you made a mistake. That just means that if the probability was, was, was 80%, that hit the 20% probability where it's not going to work out. That's the first thing I want to say. Number two, what I want to say is we, we did already discuss that we believe that on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, stock market flow creations generally are random. It can't be predicted. What we do believe is that, that um, at turning points, there are factors that show up in the stock market that are no longer random and give you a high probability trade. And I, I, I compare this somewhat to, you know, they're, 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 in the modern days, if someone has, wants to analyze his heart, like a doctor wants to analyze the health of somebody's heart, I guess they can use MRIs nowadays, or CAT scans, or analyze someone's brain. They have MRIs and CAT scans, they can see the brain. But years ago, you needed an EKG, and a doctor would make a probabilistic decision on the health of this patient based on the data that came on an EKG. Now, an EKG tells you nothing about the physical nature of the heart. And it, it only works probabilistically. It's telling you some sort of waves coming from the beats coming from the heart. And it gives the, the physician some sort of idea of the health of that, health of that, uh, that heart that it, it, it could be wrong. Or in analyzing other diseases like cancer or so, it's just probability. Now, of course, nowadays, they're able to see the object through, through modern technology. But you don't have that kind of technology in the stock market. You just don't have it. All you have is this EKG. All you have is data being transmitted by the market. And that's what we look at. We look at the data. Again, we look at the data that's not random. Data that takes place every day is not going to give us any edge. The market's up 5%, 2% today or down 2% tomorrow, 1%. These are just random fluctuations on a bell curve. Sometimes you're up 2%. Sometimes you're up a quarter of a percent on a day. Sometimes you have, you're, the market goes up 
uh, three days in a row. Somebody goes down three days in a row. It's just random. But we look at for, we look on the bell curve, we look for the tails, things that are not random. And generally, the things we look at, not only that are they random, they're reflective of some sort of euphoria or panic on the part of the market participants, those voting participants. We're looking for something that's reflective of, of, of the euphoria or panic because that's usually when turning, to, to, turning points take place. Now, this is, we have many, many disciplines, many, many kinds of indicators, but this is basically the idea. The idea is that if the market bottomed on October 12th, 2022, there are many, many indicators we saw around that period, late September, early October, that were rare and that were uh, reflective of panic or and suggested that based on history, there's enough selling pressure in the market that the market will have to turn up. But that doesn't tell you necessarily, you know, exactly the, the, the pattern that the market will follow on the way up. It just tells you that was a good low. Once you know there's a good low, you know the next low can only be up because that low will hold. Um, and uh, that's basically the, 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 the framework for what we do. Mm -hmm. I want to dive into that a bit more because some investors might be wondering how this works in more detail, because if you're thinking about a turning point in the market, many people are wondering where is going to be the bottom of the market in our current situation. What would indicate or what I guess, yeah, indicators, I know you mentioned you look at many but what would suggest that we have seen a market bottom here and then things are better? Would you have to see volume increase? Let me give you some ideas about a framework exactly what we look at. We said we look at rare factors. We don't necessarily look at one rare factor in the market. We look at combinations of factors that take place at turning points. We also do something called day counts. For example, the S&P, the, the Russell declined to 13%. Um, let me get my screen up. The Russell declined to 13% off its February highs. And it's held its low for, what is it, four or five, six, it held its low for maybe not three, four or five days since then. Um, and we look at, it's really held its interday low. So we look at counts at market turning points. In other words, the market makes a low. We, we count four days, five days, six days from the last corrective low. We haven't gone lower. You see what, what kind of data does the market generate? And this data consisted with the type of data that it generated at previous market lows that have held. So, for example, what do we look at? I'll give you a, a, history, a historical example, a great example, because it's, uh, it's uh, nothing to do with the current market, but I'll give you a, a, an example of something we've looked at. Maybe some of the viewers are familiar with the, word, with the indicator called TRIN. TRIN was an, a, a, uh, an indicator, I guess it was discovered or uh, publicized by a fellow named Richard Arms. It's also called the Arms Index. What the TRIN measures is two things combined. It measures the Ratio of advances and declines in the, in the markets in New York Stock Exchange, the ratio of advances and declines, there's 1,000 stocks up and 500 stocks down. It's a two-to-one ratio. It also measures the volume of stocks that are moving up and the volume of stocks that are moving down. So if there's a, thousand, a million shares trading on the upside and half a million shares trading on the downside, on the same day that there's 1,000 shares trading up and 500 shares trading down, it's the same ratio, two-to-one. The tree will be 1.00. There's a balance. The volume is balanced with the with the breadth. The number of stocks up and down balances with the volume of the volume in those stocks that are up and down. That's a trend of one. A trend of one is a neutral reading. You made it this far into the YouTube video, so you must be enjoying our content. If that's you, you'll also enjoy our free daily email that only takes five minutes to read per day and keeps you updated on what's happening with your money and investments. Join over 30,000 readers now by simply clicking the link in the pop-up on this video and then entering your email. It's that simple. Just click the link in the pop-up, enter your email, and start knowing what's happening with your money. But sometimes, sometimes, not very often, sometimes you get extremes. You get extremes in trend rather than being at one, it's at two or at three or at four or at five. Now, the highest trend in the history of the, of the, of the stock market, highest trend ever, was 15.50 on January 8th, 1988. Never in the history of the stock market did you see a trend. That's telling you, basically, there was 15 times as much volume in the downside than there should have been based on the ratio of stocks that are moving up and stocks that are moving down. Now, why did you see a trend of 15.50 January 8th? Because January 8th, 1988 was really just a little bit more than a month after the final low after the creation of 1987. 
I lived through that crash. I lived through that period. And people were still worried the crash is going to continue. And you got a little pullback in early January of 1988. People all of a sudden panicked and panicked and sold stocks. The market didn't go down that much that day. Well, the market actually did go down a lot that day. I think it was more than 5%. But they, there was heavy volume in the stocks that are trading down. Now, January 1988, the market never declined below that level. The market gained thousands of percent since then. That was a turning point indicator. A lot of people would suggest, wow, so much volume on the downside. Something's terrible. People must know something, right? People must know something and the market's going to crash. The reality was that was the final test of the, uh, of the 1987 crash. So that was a positive sign. Now, the second highest trend in history also took place. More, maybe more people who were watching, watching this, uh, were trading stocks at that time was October 10th, 2011. October 10th, 2011, same thing. You had a financial crisis in, 2000, in 2008, 2009. Then you had a European banking crisis in 2011. And people, many, many investors thought that the European bank is going to collapse. The market, the German DAX declined over 30% in the two-month period. The SP 500 declined some 19% over two-month period. It bottomed in, um, it bottomed, I believe, in, uh, in early October. And then it... The bottom took place with this reading of trend of 12.50. Second reading, and again, the market never got below those levels. This is a extreme example of the kind of turning point analysis we do. When we see a trend of 12.50, we don't say, wow, everybody's selling, this is negative. We know historically when you see a high trend, it means people are panicking. And when people panic, usually they make the wrong decision. When people panic, their voting is usually incorrect. So that's really a sign that the market is not going to continue lower, but the market is going to go higher. Now you may ask, how do these, what does that do with fundamental? And the answer is two things. A, it has nothing to do with fundamental, zero. Who says, who says Mark Moore has anything to do with fundamentals? But two, if people panicked, stock market people panic, it means businesses panicked. If businesses panic, it means the Federal Reserve panicked. So liquidity has been built up. But we're not analyzing the liquidity. We're not analyzing the business. We're analyzing the Fed. The market is telling you there's panic, and there's panic in the market, there's panic in the streets, there's panic all over. And with this panic, not only do people sell their stocks on high volume, people were liquidating their companies, and the Federal Reserve was lowering rates, or so on and so forth. Many other factors that we can't even measure took place on that day of uh, January 8th, 1988, or that period that allowed the market to go up and allowed the, uh, the, 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 the economy actually to continue, continue trading higher. That's one example. Another great example about volume is looking at mentioning volume, volume, as you know, the great uh, decline from 19, 19, 30, April 1930 to July 1932 took place. It was a low volume decline. Market did not show much volume at all during the decline. You know when you saw the volume? You saw the volume in July 1932 at the low, at the final low. So when everyone finally realized that the market was already down some 80% and they decided to sell, that's when you know that the uh, that's when the actual low took place. Now, we don't only look at long-term turning points. Look at, we look at short-term turning points, short-term indicators. And, um, and uh, you know, we have a, we built a, a number of indicators. I could, re I could uh, review some of them with you if that would make any sense. Yeah, um, I think that for our listeners who are typically long-term investors, what do you think would be the most useful takeaways to help them, I guess, better time their investments. Because on one hand, we are taught in finance that there is no way to time the market. That is, mm -hmm. you're often worse off. So maybe even talk about why you think it's possible to time the market and how that could benefit a long-term investor. Okay. Well, first of all, most investors, I guess most people watching this show should not be involved in trading, should not be involved in the kind of things we're talking about. It's professional and it's, uh, you have to have... Uh, not easy to do it, you know. Professionals on Wall Street do very well uh, financially because they're doing things that most people can't do. But I would say, first of all, as advice to a, people watching your show, you want to buy a, a good company. You know, you you, you don't have to be a very big genius to when a company is, is uh, when, the, when the market is euphoric and it doesn't make sense to buy stocks I mean, for a typical retail investor. But when you do buy a company, you want to buy for the long term. If you're not a trader, I'll give you advice as traders as well. You want to buy for the long term. You want to buy a company whose management has skin in the game. They're not just professional management of companies, but they actually own a good portion of the stock. And basically, investors really invest by a good company, a company that they understand, a company that they recognize, and they, they can get a sense of whether a stock is overvalued or not. If they look at dividends, there's one way to rec recognize it. They can just see the historic movement of the stock. 
and make sure the company, the manager of the company has skin in the game. That's a, a general investment. I would say if you want to follow some, some people who are recommending how to trade, if you want to trade stocks, actually actively involved in stocks, there's, I mean, the William O'Neill service is very, very good. He, he, it's a combination of technical and fundamental factors that goes into buying stocks. And he's, he's been very good, but you have to be very disciplined in following the kind of work he does. As far as what we've been talking about, which is um, what kind of things do I look at a turning point? You know, when you're ready to, when everyone you know is panicking and you're ready to panic as well, that's probably a time that you don't want to panic. That's one thing I can say. But I really can't give a specific information for retail investors. I can just give a framework for people who are interested in understanding markets. I hope I can do that. But I really can't give any specific specific advice on when a person should decide to buy a stock, when a person should try to get into the market. I really can't give specific advice other than to say, um, uh, other than to say that uh, markets are going to always fluctuate, they're always going to rally, they're always going to decline, and you're better off uh, knowing when to get out based on the fact that the stock has done well and knowing when to get in. The fact that the stock has declined is not a reason not to get in. It, 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 the fundamentals are strong. The many, many services, I don't want to advertise other people's services, but the retail service, like the value line service is a very good service. The little nail service is a good service. But as far as what I do, which is what all I can really talk about is what I do, the kind of indicators I look at, we look at five-day volume. Historically, market trading points occur when five-day volume is at an extreme. Well, we just had a, a big extreme in five-day volume last week after the 13% correction of the Russell, after the 7% correction of the SP 500. That adds a positive weight to what we're looking at. We look at net upside volume on a five-day basis and a 10-day basis, 12-day basis. Now we look at the, the amount of volume in stocks that are moving up and stocks that are moving down. We average it out over five days and 12 days. We look for extremes. We also see what's important is a day count. The market bottom, like for example, market bottom on October 12th of 2022, we count the next 10 days and see what took place over the next 10 days relative to what took place historically at market lows. And that gives you some, now, again, we have proprietary work. It's very, I can't give any, but that's just a framework. You want to count the days from a market low or count the days from a market top. The market uh, made a top now in February 2nd. We actually were very heavily long into February 2nd. We were leveraged long for our clients in February 2nd, but a few days later and during the counts from those days, we found certain unique characteristics that place at market tops. We found gaps to the upside and gaps to the downside and spike days and volume reversals and so on. So we got out. We actually back in. We're long again because it, now it looked like it was just a regular correction within the bull market rather than the beginning of a major decline. It's hard to know. Everything's probabilities. We look at... Um, we look at um, uh, the VIX, we look at the one-day rate of change, the three-day rate of change, rather than the level of VIX, which most people focus on, which is you know, it's VIX at 28, it's VIX at 25, it's VIX at 40, it's VIX at 18. We look at the rate of change of the VIX on a one-day, two-day, and three-day basis. We also look at a, a, a VIX deviation from trend. You know, if you take eight days average of VIX versus, let's say, the previous 50 days average and see how it deviated, either to the upside or to the downside, we look at, most people look at 52-week highs in the market. We look at three-year highs in the market as an indication. We look at the five-day, very important thing is the five-day rate of change. Let me tell you why that's important. Because one thing is lacking from this, from this bull market that I believe got on October 12th. I believe a bull market began on October 12th. But most bull markets begin with the five-day rate of change of the SP 500 greater than 7.4%. Most bull markets begin where the market has a strong concentrated five-day gain, a minimum of 7.4%. It's gone as high as 11, 12% at market turning points. We did not get it this time. Our highest five-day rate of change was 6% and change in June off the June lows. We got a lower return off the, off the, off the, um, off the October lows, so that's something that's lacking. But in any event, in any event um, it's a good question what retail investors should look at. I'm sort of giving you a framework of the kind of things that we do I really can't. Uh, I wish I could give some good information, other than to say be disciplined and 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 um, you, you get a sense. You know, you, there there are many stocks over the last three years that were highly speculative and way overvalued, and 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 uh, you know, overvaluation is good because if you can catch a stock when it's trending up, when it's overvalued. But for a long-term investor, never wants to hold an undervalued stock because Benjamin Graham was right. History shows that if you hold an undervalued stock, eventually it will become undervalued. If you hold an undervalued stock, eventually it will be overvalued. So that alone is a reason to be careful when stocks are trading up and overvalued. But you're going to miss some of the big moves. So I really can't give anything more, any more, any more information than I 
I've given, I know it's a, it's a, it's a difficult game being involved in, um, in the stock market. And, and um, yeah, advice, a good company with good management, that skin in the game. You know, everybody, any stock they see in the stock market, somebody's owning it. So they're either owning it for the right reason or owning it for the wrong reason. If you find a company that management is owning the stock, you can imagine they're owning it for the right reason. If you find a company whose management is just managing the company, but they don't own stock in the company, they're only for the wrong reason. They want to get their salary, they want to get their stock options, whatever, and then immediately liquidate it for cash. But if you find a company that's built by some people, like you know, Amazon was once a great example, Apple was a great example. You find a company that was very well managed, has a good product, makes good money, and the owners have the skin in the game, not strictly, you know, they're going to see the stock stock move up and, and sell the shares, uh, they will exercise their options and sell the shares. Even Tesla was a great example. Elon Musk put the bulk of his uh, his worth into that company and he managed it. So these are the kind of things I would look at if you want to uh, be a little bit safer. Make sure that the, skin, the, that the managers have skin in the game as well, not just you. Yeah, I think that was very helpful. And I guess two questions for you quick. So you kind of touched on it already. So with your indicators, everything that's telling you do you think that we we haven't seen a turning point yet than you're suggesting? And I guess the follow-up would be, do you think we've already seen a bottom or the worst is still potentially yet to come? Well, I'll give you the good news and the bad news. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get this up. Uh, hold on a moment. Okay. Yes, if you, this is the first I'll give you the bad news. We believe the market bottomed in, in October. We believe the market bottomed in October. Now, the market is fighting the Fed. Normally, when the market bottoms, it's, because, it, it, it's coincident with the Federal Reserve easing credit. It's very rare for you to see a market low when the Federal Reserve is aggressively tightening credit. But yet, the market bottomed in October 12th. It's 110 days since then, and the SP is up 10.07%. So the market has held a little, despite the fact that you've had tremendous uh, monetary tightening. In fact, the S&P made its first low in June, on June 16th, and the S&P is above its level on June 16th. June 16th is when the Fed first started getting aggressive. They raised rates 0.75% in June, 0.75% in July, 0.75% in, 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 in September, 0.75% in November. So the market is higher than it was when the Fed first started raising rates. Very, very strange, very non-typical. So the good news is the market's doing well despite the fact that the Fed has been raising rates. That's good news. The, 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 the bad news is, is that I understand there's a reason for it, though. What the market is telling us is that the Fed really hasn't tightened because even after the last tightening a couple of days ago, the Fed funds rate is still below the inflation rate. When Paul Volcker got a handle on inflation, he raised the Fed funds rate 10% above the inflation rate. We're now 1% below the inflation rate. So the good news is that the market was telling us they're not tight enough. The bad news is that eventually they're going to have to tighten. And eventually you're going to have a good bear market, a really good bear market, because eventually you're going to have to tighten if they want to fight inflation. How do we know the Fed wants to fight inflation? This won't be the first country that didn't fight inflation. Maybe the Fed will decide, and maybe there'll be some political uh, um, um, uh, pressure on them to keep the economy going and, and ignore inflation. Maybe they'll raise the inflation as to, um, a boundary from 2% to 4%. We don't know. We don't know the market has been rallying and despite the fact that the Fed is so-called tightening. Logically, it tells me they really haven't been tightening. So the, the good news is that the market's doing well. The bad news is that they may be tightening ahead, but right now we're bullish. Now, another piece of bad news is that the S&P has gained 10.07% in 110 days since its low. It had been up as much as 16.685%, but now at, at yesterday's close, we're 110 days past the lower up 10.07%. Now, let's assume a bull market began on October 12, 2022. That would be the 24th bull market since 1957. Of those 24 bull markets since 1957, 23 of them, actually 22 of them, showed greater returns than 10.07%. We're second to the left. The worst return by day 110 was 1957. It only gained 8% through day 110, and ultimately gained 32% in the first year off the low. We've gained 10% in 110 days, and uh, 
you know, you, no one likes to be, you know, when there's 24 opportunities, you don't like to be second from the, from the last. So that's a sign that maybe the market isn't acting as, as well as it should. But that doesn't phase us. As long as there's one historical instance where the market uh, gained um, less than it did now in a bull market, we'll stick with our bull thesis especially since we, we have buy signals, buy indicators suggesting the bull thesis. Now, there's better news in the NASDAQ is that NASDAQ's closing low was on December 28th. NASDAQ has gained 14.26% in 57 days since then. And of the previous 12 bull markets in the NASDAQ since, since 1974, the 1974 bull market only saw a gain of 6% by day 57. 1984 was only a gain of 9.93%. So you have a situation... You have in 1978, it only gained 12.11%. And in 1980, it only, 1990, it only gained 10.31%. So there are many instances in the NASDAQ where the returns were weaker than they are currently. And each of those, the, each of those instances, returns were phenomenal. The median return of those uh, 12 historical bull markets was 66% within one year of the low. So the, the, the NASDAQ is still in line based on history. Now, you know. Uh, we we uh, we were negative until a few days ago. We went long based on our indicators, and uh, uh, yesterday's decline didn't um, didn't in fact added some bullish weight to the indicators because there's some panic like action yesterday's decline. But we'll be flexible to change our minds. But right now we're bullish. We think a bull market get in October, and uh, it, it won't be the greatest bull market because the Fed is raising rates. He may still have a bull market because uh, the Federal Reserve is not as tight as he should be. But once they become as tight as they should be. You, you know, there'll be trouble ahead. So just got to monitor the market and the economy, see again, the Federal Reserve day by day and, and watch our indicators. Basically, um, that's where we stand. We like gold. We like the action in gold. We like the action in gold stocks. That's also suggesting the probability that um, that there's inflation ahead of us. I mean, gold stocks rallied over 50% from the October lows until the highs in, February, in late January. They, they corrected 20%, but now they're back on a tear, back moving up again. And so too with gold. Gold made came within a few percentage points of its all-time high just a few weeks ago, and now it's pulled back sharply, and then it's starting to rally again. So I think gold and uh, gold stocks is a good place to be on a, on a trading basis. Okay. That be my view. That's very helpful. And last thing before I let you go, what advice would you give our listeners from your many years and experience as an investor? What's the best piece of advice you have for them? Well, I, I know that Kahneman and Tversky in their book about um, the, the, the Nobel Prize winning work on uh, heuristics, on decision making, said that the worst decision investors make is selling the good stocks and holding on to the losing stock. So I would say, as a piece of advice, based on scientific studies, you don't want to hold on to your losing stock, but you want to hold on to your Winning stock. Now, how do you define a winning stock? How do you define a losing stock? You have to get into the statistics on that. But very often, I have a gain, let me get out. I have a loss. Oh, how can I sell it? It's at a loss. It's going to come back. That's exactly the opposite. That's one piece of advice. The other piece of advice is what I gave earlier. You can buy a good company with good management. They have a skin in the game. And uh, I invest that way. And maybe, you know, be, use common sense and be logical and don't chase stocks that are doing poorly unless you have some good um, technical or database reason to do it. And um, there are methodologies that many investors are aware of and how to how to trade stocks or how to invest in stocks. It's not it, it, it's never been an easy game. It never will be an easy game. If there's inflation ahead of us in the economy, you definitely want to be in stocks for the long term because even in a place like Venezuela and Argentina and and and, and Germany in there in the 1920s, you, although you didn't keep up with inflation, you came close to keeping up with inflation by investing in stocks. Um, of course, you had to get out before the final high because they ultimately all crashed. So a lot of history, a lot of information. I really, I really, be, I really wish it would be easy. You know, people get up to buy Bitcoin, buy gold, you know, buy growth stocks, buy Apple. I, I, I can't say that. I just use common sense, be flexible. You're going to buy a company, buy a company whose management is on your side. And there are many, many companies out there whose management are totally not on your side. And, and people have to be aware of that. I think that was a great piece of advice to end things off today. Before I let you go, though, where can the audience go to learn more about you and everything that you do? Okay, I'd like to thank you, Rebecca, for this interview. Um, Lemon Investing is very, I enjoyed it. It was great. Uh, we have a website, www.miltonberg.com, and you, there's information there on how to follow what we do. And also, I occasionally uh, tweet on Twitter. 
And the my Twitter handle, I guess it's called, is at Berg Milton. At B-E-R-G Milton. There are some phonies that use a very similar uh, address. You got to be careful to get the one with the blue check. They don't know it's me. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll make sure to add all of those in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on again, Milton. So when I look at it, I, I see a very bullish setup for particularly oil, but I think natural gas as well. One of the best ways I've found to make money is to own something that's in an uptrend, but where it's had a fairly significant pullback within that uptrend. So I think at this very specific point in time, it makes sense to be getting defensive again. 